I was thinking about um, all the episodes I've recorded so far. I think I've recorded seven or eight that I've counted. And um, originally I wanted to <laughs> post the one that you and I re-recorded first, but it was, it's so serious that I was also thinking maybe I'll post this first. I don't know. Cause oh, this, yeah, yeah. cause what we wanted to talk about today was, you know, top 10 films, but we can also talk about anything. Cause there was some other stuff from one of our conversations and maybe it's just what we talk about on our own that I remember thinking about, like, I, I remember thinking about, when we were talking about uh, what it's like to be an actor in LA, since you've spent so much time there and you'll be going back there soon and uh, talking about <laughs> how every guy thinks that they're going to be Leonardo DiCaprio. I've heard it so much, <laughs> especially when they're talking to girls like, yeah, I'll meet with the next Leonardo DiCaprio. I was like, shut the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I would, I, you know, Oh, there goes my mumbling again. Uh, uh, it's my biggest pet peeve when I listen back to some of these clips. Uh, but uh, it's funny because even though LA has some of those stereotypes, like what we were just talking about, uh, some of, you know, everyone thinks they're going to be a star and there's fake people here and there. I also like genuinely want to get back down there because I there's to me, there's still like some magic down there and there's, you know, people there who genuinely want to work hard and make cool shit. And, uh, and even though I think the industry is probably going to change and not be so centralized, I still think like, you know, the history is there. It would yeah. be exciting to spend more time there. You must be excited to be headed back there. Very excited. I mean, besides my, all my roots and my family and friends all there um, and the weather um, and your basketball yeah. squad. <laughs> uh i'm very excited um it's honestly home i feel i feel uh, a kind of a comfort level um i think driving or like taking trains around new york to do auditions would be so like so um my like rattling for me that i mm. honestly i i've gone on like maybe 400 auditions uh in la and i just know like just how to drive and how to deal with the traffic and just, you know, having that expectation and it kind of, it quote unquote helped me. I never fucking booked anything, but, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just, just, it's more of a comfort level. Um, and yeah, yeah, there are some really cool people, a lot of good filming locations and um, yeah. obviously a lot of studios if I ever make it that big. So yeah, very exciting. And the weather. The weather is very nice. I will. It's on my to-do list. I've been, COVID kind of pushed that all back. I like, I think 2020, one of my plans was to make a trip down there just to like check it out and like get an Airbnb. And maybe I'll do that in the next year. Maybe I'll try and time it when I know you're down there. Well, when I'm down there, you should just, uh, we have a guest room so you can stay with us. Sounds good. <laughs> Deal. Yeah. Oh. For a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do, let's, uh, we can talk, but let's do this. Uh, I want to get into this top 10 thing um, just for fun. Let's get this out of the way. Um, break it down, what we're doing. What's that? You want to break it down what we're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So we're okay. So we're doing our top 10 films um, by any sort of criteria because it's not. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the greatest films ever made. No, no, no. These aren't our top 10 movies. These are our favorite movies. Sure. Well, what in whatever whatever your criteria is, your top ten favorite or most influential, or you've watched them the most. Because oh, yeah. I think that's what that, I did. I watched them the most, and I will continue to keep watching them. That is a factor for me because if I were to say, like, there are a good example is, um, like, Twelve Years a Slave. You see that? I I have n I have not. Um, <laughs> I have not been in the men right mental state to put myself okay. through that. <laughs> my, my point exactly. Phenomenal <laughs> film. It won the Oscar, what, uh, who knows, a couple okay. years ago. And I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get myself to watch it for a while because it was, yeah, yeah same thing. I was like, ah, that's, that's going to be heavy. I need to wait. Yeah. And sure enough, I watched it. It was really heavy. It was amazing. I don't, I don't know no, if I'm going to ever watch it again. Up. <laughs> I, like I know exactly what you're talking about. Or another good example is Requiem for a Dream. You ever see that film? 
No, I never Fu- heard. Oh, of it. that fucked me up. That was. Oh, it does mess people a lot. It I, it fucks I, you I, up. I, it's a brilliant film, but I don't think I'll. I might watch it again someday, and maybe I'm older and it won't like freak me out as much. Perfect. But I'm, even when I watched it, I think I was like 24, 25, and it was just like, oh my gosh! I mean, it was just it was great filmmaking, but it was just I'm. Not, <laughs> I don't want to watch that a lot. So some yeah. some of the films on my list are, you know, they are not going to be considered the greatest films of all time, but they mean something to me. And uh, it sounds like that is a similar criteria for you, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and we also and, uh, we also have some honorable mentions, right? Because like, there's so much that's not on my list where like, you feel uh, bad, right? <laughs> there, there's yeah, there's like four or five honorable mentions that I, I'm going to have to throw in there as well. Do you um, want to start with the honorable mentions? Uh, we could, what do you, what would you prefer? Would you rather start at the top and work? I did. Down? I did mine 10 to one. Like, <clears throat> okay. We, we can movie, go 10 to one. And my, the number one is like the movie. I like find myself consistently going back to. Okay. So let me just modify my list. Cause, um, Uh, I'll I'll do mine and I'll do that in reverse order too, and so let's do some honorable mention. Um, oh, and uh, I, you know I'll put your name in the description for this episode. But if if none of you know who James Haley is, he's uh, <laughs> one of the best guys I've ever met. We oh. we went to college together at UC Irvine. We met um, we met freshman year when I was. Uh, trying to pursue doris garcia i had a crush on her and then i i i went to i i met up with her at her her dorms and that's where you were living and then we uh eventually i (laughs) cut my losses couldn't couldn't win over doris and hung out with you and (laughs) we used to tear it up on the the basketball court and uh Um, and then we lived together for a year in college and uh and now we're friends (laughs) <laughs> best friends, best friends. <laughs> forever <laughs> okay uh oh and he's an actor and a comedian and a filmmaker too well try, try it not not as good as you but i i, I dabble no you you're you're great <laughs> and i i was i was involved too because i made the thumbnail right for youtube yes you did you, you asked me did. to it yeah. was really it, it really helped i i honestly think that's that probably what really put cool. it over the edge <laughs> I, got, it put us from uh, 400 views to 500 views <laughs> <laughs> well hey that's good um okay so let so we explained it we're doing top 10 plus so yes. um I'll well, go yeah for... and, I, and i and you gotta stop me because i know these things okay. can run long where we can um well, we can do this forever i mean let, let's pretend no one's actually going to listen to this and just talk however the hell we want Okay. Sounds good. good. Because that's part of the point of this podcast is that it's just. We're just talking. We're just talking. (laughs) Want me to go first? For for a while, it probably will just be us talking by ourselves. (laughs) I'll have you on a few times, probably. Just be like, hey, you want to shoot the shit? (laughs) I need an episode here. What's going on? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you know, work. (laughs) Oh, man. Um, Okay. I. yeah, I'm just modifying my honorable mention, but um, I'll never have them all. But you, well, yeah, my you honorable start... mentions are in no order. Yeah, same. I th- I just want to give example. Let's just start talking about them because we're we're leading up to it so much. So, what are what uh, are some of the your... after this break though? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll start then. I'll start. Okay. So, first of all, on my top ten list, um, I'll say I'll say one thing that, um. You know, first of all, these are films. These are feature films. So, uh, you know, there's so much great stuff happening with um, series now, uh, which might be on par with some of this stuff, to be honest. Uh, But also second to that, I've also become more interested in specific directors in the last few years. And there are a couple directors um, that aren't on my list. For example, Wes Anderson, Christopher Nolan, um and then uh some films that are not on my list but i think are very special to me are lord of the whole lord of the rings trilogy especially if 
you go on YouTube and watch all the behind the scenes footage uh, that Peter Jackson posted to his YouTube channel, it's like anyone who's interested in filmmaking will just be blown away by it. It looks like the coolest project to have ever been a part of. Um, and then also I hold in very high regard movies like Jurassic Park and The Goonies, which mm. I think The Goonies is my favorite kids movie ever, which uh, I mean, it it goes back to what we were saying earlier. It's not it didn't win an Oscar, but how many kids did that affect positively compared to some of these more artistic films that were seen by a smaller group of people? And same with Jurassic Park, which is just one of the greatest like tr like uh, blockbuster films, you know, like yeah. um, and so th those are some things on my list. And then the the other. Yeah, there's some other stuff, but let I'll cut it off on there for me. Um, uh, well, those are things that didn't make my list. So what are you thinking? Well, let me let me comment quickly. Uh, yeah. I think Jurassic Park is <clears throat> incredible. Yeah, I I find myself rewatching that too. Um, I'll, I think a lot of it had to do with the production value and the uh, puppet puppetry and animatronics versus CGI. Because mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen the Jurassic World series; they are so incredibly bad <laughs> that it's laughable. I've audibly laughed in the movie theater probably because I was so upset I paid 10 or $15 to see it. But you go back to that first Jurassic park, yeah. just the suspense building, the, the uh, acting. Um, <clears throat> and, and I, I don't know, you just buy in that this is actually happening, even though the, <laughs> the uh, uh, premise is so absurd. Well, and the original, um, I think the best thing about it is that they, um, you know, a large part of this goes to Steven Spielberg they perfectly set up the whole movie where, you know, there's the scary thing at the very, very beginning, kind of like mm -hmm. the prologue to it all, you could call it. Um, but the whole thing leading up to, you know, their, uh, what's his name? Um, Ham oh. John Hammond, oh, yeah. uh, you know, how he goes to convince their, their, you know, uh, you know, excavating dinosaur bones and then, or fossils and, and then he gets them to come out on the helicopter and it's, and so like it really sets it up like you know you, you get the dinosaur content but then it gets gets you in that mindset where it's like okay we're in the helicopter and we're actually going to this amazing island and it looks you know i think they probably shot it in hawaii or something like or a similar island and it just like they set up the adventure so well um and i think most movies now kind of kind of rush that a bit yeah, too much a hundred percent they like i said they they really build up and the, the kind of uh it's not the climax but the i guess the chapters climaxes really hit home because you're like it's earned um yeah and, and i don't think especially the jurassic world movies they don't earn it they they dive right in and and the dinosaurs look terrible and the acting is terrible <laughs> um but anyway well yeah and they um the they fall into the trap of uh, and this is all movies and all tv shows unfortunately they all always fall into this trap that they have to be bigger and crazier than what came yeah. before yeah and it's like you just you are going to set yourself up for failure at some point yeah. like uh, what's next like <laughs> dinosaurs with nuclear weapons attached to dinosaurs them? Like, in space take yeah. over the moon <laughs> It's what Fast and the Furious is doing right now, and I have not watched the past like three of them. It's yeah, just I still need to see that one, that last one. I I saw it over a woman's shoulder, like uh, on an airplane, where I just happened to glance over at the screen in front of her, and it, I think it was Vin Diesel in a car flying through space. Uh, they, no, through I, space. I think they, I think they shoot a car into space to like get to a satellite or something. I'm pretty oh sure that's what God. I saw. That's wild. I could be wrong. Wait, let me look this up. Let me look this up. <laughs> I, I could be full of it. Fast and Furious Nine, and uh, I'm pretty sure that's what what's happened. Okay, I'm looking up the plot. Okay, so. 
Um, drop. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, so someone goes to the International Space Station. That's what that does happen. I'm not going to sit here and read all this, but they go to in the space. They go to the International Space Station. I'm telling you. <laughs> that is wild. But anyways, what, let, let's get back to this. What, what, what else is in, what's in your uh, what's in your honorable mention? Well, I'm just going to read them off. And then if you want to comment on any of them, <clears throat> feel free, because I don't really have much to say about them. Um, okay. Stand by me. Mm. Um, the Sandlot for my kind of kids movie. Oh, yeah. Um, the other guys with Mark um, Wahlberg, Mark Wahlberg, and fucking Will Ferrell. Yeah. Which, and I honestly think it's Will Ferrell's best movie. He plays it really grounded, and I think it's Mark Wahlberg's best comedy. He they make such a good pairing. Um, Dark Knight Rises with Bane. I did mm -hmm. not. I liked it better than Dark Knight, and I watch myself. I find myself watching Dark Knight Rises a lot more. <clears throat> Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Nice. A, 80s classic um friday ice cube and chris tucker super bad we saw that in the movie theater together oceans 11 and oceans 13 not oceans 12 i felt so <laughs> betrayed by oceans 12 and how bad it was um yeah. but oceans 13 is actually a really fun one it's not as great as oceans 11 but um it's really fun some really good scenes um and uh, some really good uh, lines, some some kind of one-liners that hit hard. Any comments on any of those? <clears throat> yeah, Sandlot was so good. I watched that a ton as a kid. And your Oceans uh, picks uh, made me think of my favorite James Bond movie, which is Casino Royale. Yes. Uh, I mean, but the honorable mentions, we could go on and on forever. But I do like yours. I never, I don't think I ever saw Stand By Me. Oh, it's... um, um it's Which I know it's a classic. Movie. Oh yeah. With uh River Phoenix. Yeah. Um, and it's uh <clears throat> kind of reminds me of the Sandlot a little more serious. Um yeah. the thing about Sandlot that got me was at the end when they're all playing baseball and then it kind of um they're they, like the players fade away as they're throwing the ball and it's yeah. just like, oh so and so went here and the so and so went there. And that really actually really hit me hard as a kid, because like I was like, is this gonna happen to me? Like, am I not because <laughs> like as a kid, like your friends are everything. I was like, are we all yeah. gonna like just not disappear <laughs> and lo and behold like people move away and life happens and yeah. uh, so i thought it was really a poignant kind of uh ending there yeah all right well now now that we've established was that were those your only honorable mentions jurassic park and uh, goonies i said lord of the rings and i said uh oh, yeah. christopher nolan and wes anderson uh i oh. uh yeah I, catalog i i will say one thing that definitely changed for me was after i made uh my first short film i i sort of had this revelation of how much there is besides just acting because like growing up you see the actors and that's what i mean tarantino has said this uh about himself and his now I, now I sound like I'm associating myself with Tarantino. <laughs> no, but I think it's a common thing where you like you see <laughs> movies and it's like that is all you think about is like man these these characters and these actors are amazing and uh you know that's who we as associate ourselves with and like that's how what we associate the story with. Um but then like after putting something together it was just like shit like that you know that is an important part but it is a part you know and it's like learning about cinematography and the like the way that directors can shape scenes and um i mean it's just the there's endless possibilities with how people tell stories and and there's all these people involved in that on the crew side of things that is crazy. And so anyways, the point I'm getting to is once I started thinking more about uh, once my eyes were kind of opened to all these talented types of individuals who I had never fully appreciated, uh, it started making me go back and watch a lot of different films. And uh, yeah, Christopher Nolan, I mean, even his first film is great. 
uh it holds up so well and he shot that thing in like the 90s on black and white 16 millimeter film and um i've rewatched all of wes anderson's stuff which it's all so quirky and you know personal to him um but anyways enough of, we need to get to get to these lists um, we really honored those mentions didn't we <laughs> <laughs> now we're just gonna fly through these lists and not even talk yeah. about them um we to start oh and i second what you were saying about dark knight rises mm. i love bane like what a yeah. badass villain yeah what a badass and and a christopher nolan movie yep and um i'm actually an Anne hathaway fan so yeah suck on that <laughs> 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 all right let's go um what's what's your number 10 my number 10 is goodwill hunting mm. ever heard of it <laughs> <laughs> um i i watch this movie um regularly maybe twice a year um <clears throat> really powerful stuff really powerful scenes um uh, a really i think unique story um and just the uh, I guess, you know, I don't want to just summarize what happened, but I'll say I think Ben Affleck's character is underrated. Um, I don't know if you remember the scene where they're in the construction zone and he actually mm-hmm. calls out Matt Damon's character. It's like, hey, man, like <laughs> the line is like, I'll fucking kill you if like if like you don't if you come back. Right. Uh, uh, or if you're if you don't like take this seriously. Um and I guess I guess the one thing I can say is, you know, maybe um, that this happens a lot in life where people just don't try to do things, maybe <clears throat> because it's of some past trauma uh, or they're afraid of failure. Um, but, you know, as I get more poignant with life, you know, what is life but to enjoy it and, and pursue what your passions are, what you're good at um instead of just playing it safe mm-hmm. so I, I i see it as a little bit of an inspiration um and that you know i can go on and on robin williams is great and uh some really yeah. powerful scenes. uh yeah and also i like to point out that i have to remind myself that uh matt damon's character kind of a shithead <laughs> like, this dude commits crimes over and over again but uh you know um uh, there's this thing i saw on instagram it's like we're not yeah we're not it, it's not our fault for the trauma we we go through but it is our responsibility to get through it um without affecting other people's lives negatively so sure uh, what do you think any thoughts yeah i mean it's a classic um uh, yeah it's interesting because i like the film it's just never connected with me that much, but I respect it a lot, especially with those three. Cause you know, it was the first film. I mean, it's always interesting for people like us to look at how people's careers really got going and how they did their first big thing. And so mm-hmm. I actually think about that film more in regards to, Oh, this was how, matt and ben got started that is more important to me than the actual film honestly and i think the fact that they are able to get robin williams involved uh incredible awesome and that i think that was his first oscar that he got yeah Um, it was which i think i always what's that i think first and only that makes sense yeah and um yeah, I mean, those are my main thoughts. We sorry, right, sorry. One last thing. Yeah, uh, it, it it inspired me to experience life and to get out and travel. Um, the scene where he's calling um uh, Matt Damon's character out on the bench, where he's like, "Oh, and if I asked you about you know loss, you'd probably quote this book. But have you ever done this? Um, have you ever you know, uh, you know, I I could. It's the scenes all over YouTube. Um, you mean where actually, he's in the bar where he's talking? No, outside on the bench where um. He's uh, talking to Matt Damon and, oh. and he's like, and the, the final line is like, do you think I know about your life? Because I read um, uh, Oliver Twist because you're an orphan. It's like, no, I want I need to know you and your experience. Uh, um, okay. 
and yeah, it's like if I, if I asked you about Michelangelo, you could probably rattle off whatever you read in the book. But have you ever have you ever been to the Sistine Chapel? That actually inspired me to go to to, to the Sistine Chapel when I visited Italy. Oh, really? And, very beautiful and breathtaking took a long time to get there but um yeah, it is worth it the a long walk yeah <laughs> anyway I've, what's your I've number 10 been there yeah uh, i, I need to go to the sistine chapel by the way okay number 10 you're never gonna guess this priscilla queen of the desert <laughs> <laughs> that's right for my number 10 given a slight wink and a nod to all my gay friends out there listening. <laughs> okay. Do you know Priscilla Queen of the Desert? I don't. I know it's like oh my gosh. an LGBTQ uh It's about movie. three I... drag queens getting in a bus and traveling halfway across Australia to do a performance. And um yeah, when I tell <laughs> when I tell my gay friends that I like this movie, they all like it's like you know, you they ca- <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it kind of opens the question like, uh, maybe there's more to John than I thought. <laughs> maybe there's some unanswered questions there. No, but really, so here's what I think it is, is that so, you know, the longer you live in New York and the longer you are a part of, you know, the theater community in one way or another, the more time you're going to spend in gay bars and mm-hmm. And also most of my most of my friends in New York are part of the LGBT community. And um, and also as someone who has produced a bunch of concerts and cabarets. Almost all of them have been in in um, performance spaces attached to gay bars. So it's like um, what I'm getting to is that that is that energy and that uh, community is just like ingrained in my life and has been for the last many years. And so I actually didn't watch this movie. Um, I don't even know why I did. I think I watched it on a whim, but I watched it during the start of COVID. And I think why it resonated with me so much is that the opening scene of the movie is in a gay bar with two drag queens performing and they just nailed it. Like it's not the best movie ever, but they nailed the feeling of this community and they nailed the feeling of having kind of a shit life and you're, you're juggling the um, just how hard it is to want to be a performer, but you're not getting money by doing that. And you, you're trying to finagle your life and make it work to do the thing you love. And you're shoving, you're, you're stopping your life and shoving everything into a bus to drive across the desert to do the one gig that is being offered to you. And, yeah. um, and also the whole thing is filled with disco music, which most people don't know this, but like growing up for whatever reason i just love disco music i was just (laughs) like in middle like in middle school i went through a like a two-year obsession with it where i just thought it was like the greatest music ever made and now and lately i've started thinking about it a lot and actually you can kind of see it come back into some pop music like i would i would argue that a lot of dua lipa's music like i think there is sort of like hints of a disco vibe yeah Mm. i mean it's party me like it's party music. It's it's good fun and um but yeah, that movie just I think it I think it just was helpful to for to me during the pandemic because it allowed me to sort of like I don't know, feel that feeling again of what my life has become here in New York. Um and Had you already started to do cabarets? When I when I saw this? Yeah. Yeah, so like I so pre-pandemic I produced uh like 10 shows like 10 you could call them cabarets or concerts or whatever and then also just by virtue of like hanging out with friends like i was i was always in gay bars all the Mm -hmm. time um and then and then there's the disco connection and um so this is the type of movie that i'll just kind of have on in the background sometimes like uh i don't watch it quite as much anymore but during the pandemic I, i feel like i watched it like seven or eight times just because you know we had nothing else to do and um so now i've seen it enough times that i just kind of watch it for fun in the background Um, i'll have to give it a shot 
Yeah, there is one. <laughs> there is one controversial part in the movie because that didn't age well. Where there's this, uh, what is it? It's like this. There's this brief Filipina character who is like this really bad stereotypical oh, Asian woman. Um, it's. I mean, the whole movie's very over the top, but. And when I first watched it, it wasn't necessarily I, I didn't get like a racist vibe from it. It was more like, man, this character is really annoying. But then as I I looked it up, it was like, yeah, a lot of people took it the wrong way because it's like you're making this woman look. Yeah, she's a caricature and she looks crazy. Mm -hmm. And like it, you know, it, it kind of gives that racist assumption that this is how Filipino women are, you know, but. It's, Asian it's, roles in the '90s were were very yeah. uh, typecast, if you will. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's one of the. It's weird because it, you know, it's a film about the LGBT community, which you would think is, you know, very liberal and aware, and would have avoided something like yeah, that. Yeah. But uh, uh, unfortunately, even this movie has its flaws. But uh, I, hey, aside from that bit. Um, it's a fun film. Uh, let's keep it going. <clears throat> My number nine. Yep. Heat. Oh. Al Pacino, Robert De Niro. De Niro. De Niro. <laughs> Full disclosure. Derelinko. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> I I had never heard of this story until <clears throat> movie podcast uh, uh, extraordinaire the rewatchables by the ringer um uh frequently uh, start i think started this their their podcast because of this movie and i was like what the hell is this um movie all about and i watched it and it's absolutely incredible um it's about a, a bank heist um uh, um in la mm -hmm. uh, uh by a guy who does bank heist and a cop who stops them and it it's from a an era that I think is over, like these one off, incredible yeah piece of movies. Even if it's action, but just like Oscar worthy actors like giving it their all. Now, you know everything is is a is a franchise, and it's like yeah. we're not gonna make this. We're not gonna put a lot of money if we're if we can't get like six movies out of it. Fast and Furious, um, now Mortal Kombat. Um, so it's it's a really cool interesting <laughs> it's it's also just a really cool movie um i like how when you're when you went to reference giant franchises one of the top two you thought of was mortal Kombat. no uh the new mortal Kombat. it's going to be a franchise is it okay yeah i thought yeah. you're going to say like harry potter star wars <laughs> <laughs> mortal Kombat. they just started but uh it's going to be huge <laughs> no i'm talking <laughs> I'm just saying because like they're jumping in on the franchise. Yeah, that's uh, why they were willing to do it. Exactly. Um, but but this is just a really cool movie with a uh, just star studded cast. Um, and you know it. It's, it's nothing really inspirational about it. It's just incredible scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, and and again, it just it goes back to an era where, it's like let's put all our eggs in one basket and make in one incredible movie that I think we're seeing less and less uh, yeah. of uh, these days, unless it's like some independent movie. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, it's incredibly loud too. those gunshot scenes. I'm like, Holy <laughs> shit. Like, <laughs> turning down my, my volume. Um, have you ever heard, have you ever seen it? So I'm pretty sure I haven't, but it's, 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 I, I totally right know now. it. I totally <clears throat> know it. I hear about it all the time when people are talking about nineties movies and um, I think I think the reason I haven't seen it, I'm just double checking. I don't think there's an easy way to see it online. Because usually if I can find yeah, a way I... to see a movie, I, I'll like with one of the, I have all the subscription services. Yeah. So with all of these, you need like something else. So like I, I, I'm going to see it. I'm going to make a point of seeing this because uh, I'm you overdue. Want, do you have a DVD player? Uh Yeah. If you ever want a movie, go on eBay and just type in whatever yeah. DVD. They sell them for like two dollars if, sure. if you really want to see a movie. Um, and did yeah. you know that um, when you well, it's different with these streaming services, but like if you buy a movie on 
like Apple, you don't technically own it. Have you heard this? No. You're so that they could take it away from you. Well, they you're what you're <clears throat> really doing is you're getting a indefinite le- a indefinite rental. And if they forever have something change with the rights for them to wow. to distribute it, then they will right. take it off their server and it'll be gone from your library. Because I think I think that has happened to me. But the only way to actually own a copy of a movie is still a physical copy. Yep. So is that the same on Amazon Prime? Uh well, Amazon Prime, I mean like. I mean, I guess that's true, probably. I think it's a legal thing. I don't think there's a way for these companies to sell you a digital copy. I think yeah. that's what the I think that's what the current legal situation is. Um, but anyways, that was just fun fact about DVDs. FYI. Okay, Door so number, number nine. nine. Number nine. Um, still actually still knocking on the door of uh, a oh, little game. bit of what I was talking about earlier. A um, little bit of a theme. <laughs> I'm just going to paint all the colors of the rainbow with my movies. <laughs> so, uh, no, but this is for real. Number nine, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Oh, uh, yeah. And I'll tell you why. It's not It's not the best movie. But, <laughs> but it's fun. But I will say this. A, a big thing I'm really into is community. And shit, I dropped my list. And... I the first time I saw it, I went to one of those performances with like a shadow cast where, you know, a a movie theater uh, projects it at midnight and then everyone comes dressed up and there's a shadow cast who's performing it and lip syncing it down below. And everyone's like throwing the rice and they have the sayings. And me and um, my friends at the time, we went to a we went to a bunch of those. I just thought it was like one of the most cool unique yep. the uh film experiences that i'd ever had and i love um the counterculture i don't know if that's the way to say it but just like how you know it represents the outcasts and the freaks and the you know and that's kind of what priscilla does like it, it that movie kind of shows what it's like to be an outcast and uh rocky horror kind of lifts outcasts up in a way and um and you can tell it's like i mean it's like if you go to comic-con it's like people get it's the same thing as rocky horror people get dressed up and you can tell that this is a (laughs) situation where they can like be confident and be themselves in a way that they couldn't do yeah yeah it's it you know so it's what that uh, movie represents going back to what you said about community i think you know especially with covid like experiencing something as a group amongst like uh strangers is yeah. so foreign i mean we have sports um yeah. but, but an art uh, i think rocky Por- rocky horror picture show did i say that right yeah uh, is so unique um because even like a stand-up comedy show it's like you're still kind of it's just the one person it's not yeah us connecting um i'm motioning to <laughs> my left right here for the record um, <laughs> um that that yeah and I, I i can't even think at the top of my head something like that um that, that's very unique i guess even like like drive-in theaters you're still in your own car and you know the culture we're in where it's like you put in your headphones and you're like oblivious oblivious to the entire world yeah um, very, very good point it's a very unique movie um that does offer that type of uh experience agreed What's number Great. nine for you? My number nine was... Um... Oh, was Heat. Oh, yeah. So we're, I guess we'll do like a snake draft here. So I'll go up to my eight. If you want. <laughs> okay. So um, so my number eight, I'll say in parentheses, is Quentin Tarantino movies. All of them? <laughs> but I had to pick one. And I picked Inglorious Bastards. You and that is my that's that on your list. Six. That's my number six. We can talk about it. So I each of his films does something different for me. 
Um, and the reason why I landed on Inglorious Bastards is because uh, that opening scene was is the best written scene I've seen in a film. And I remember seeing it in theaters. And that was when, you know, I still, what, early 20s um, and uh, still learning about the arts and still kind of figuring it out. And it just, it just like hit, it just hit with me. Like, I think there's been few times where I've actually been able to appreciate uh, like, oh, that was well-written or that film did this well. Like this was the, one of the first films where I could actually distinctly think in my mind, that is definitely an amazing script and a great film on the whole. It was so good. Um and it really opened the door to me appreciating uh, other Tarantino films. That's the film that got me hooked on his films. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of a little bit opposite of what you said. This is I saw this movie before I got into acting and movies so that I was able to completely buy in and just have this experience as just like, mm -hmm. and I want to buy into movies uh, anyway, but this was before I got into like, oh, here it comes. Oh, that was a good line or, or just analyzing. Yeah. yeah. Um, you talked about that first scene. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the scene in the bar. Oh, uh, yeah. So good. I was on the edge of my seat. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, I, like, and like tensed up. And after the movie, my friends were like, oh, that movie was so boring. There was no, no action. I was like you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I'm like sweating here. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're like, you know, they're, they go in there and then they're, they had, they see the bars and they're like, no, we gotta like stay here kind of thing. And then out of nowhere, there's like, Holy crap. There's this whole other room with a whole nother person yeah. there. Yeah. And he comes in and uh, just really good stuff. It's a 20 minute scene, but like I'm bought in the, the entire time. Um, just a really incredible movie. Um, there's more I want to say about um, Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> Spoiler alert, you're going to hear more of them in my <laughs> list. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. Okay, let's go to your... Um... Yeah, my in number. my... That's good. Yeah, so I'll say more in a second. Yeah, let's go to your number eight. No, no, do you have something about Inglourious Bastards? No, 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 no. It'll make more sense later. Yeah, let's go to you. Okay. Number eight. Um, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Mm. By Richie. I've only seen it once. Oh, I you probably didn't understand it because it's a lot going on and the it's a very British accent movie, Cockney kind of yeah. references. Um <clears throat> so this kind of going back to what I said about Heat, this is like a one-off movie where someone just had a crazy ass story and with multiple parties just intersecting uh and just like fitting the puzzle. It's like a, a, a jigsaw puzzle that's scattered all over the place. And then at the end, it just fits perfectly. Um, hilarious. Um, kind of maybe for the wrong reasons. I just think the British accent and their, their, the way they enunciate can really hit home something that's funny that just wouldn't sound funny in an American accent. Um, excellent, excellent uh, movie. I suggest watching it with subtitles it will really help <laughs> uh, keep uh the story and pieces together um in this movie also um <clears throat> with so many uh different parties guy i noticed this as a an analyzer of films uses music uh theme musics <clears throat> theme music certain songs for each party each gang that can help you to help distinguish uh who you're uh, uh hanging out with at the time yeah. that i think um like you said, you know, so many pe so many people go into telling a story. The music has a lot to do with it, and I think for independent film makers such as ourselves, uh, music is probably one of the first things to go to cut costs. Um, mm -hmm. So that's all I'll say about that. Highly recommended. Yeah, I I like Guy Ritchie. I, my favorite film of his is Snatch. Guess what? Um, my number seven. <laughs> <laughs> let's keep it going yeah. so, <laughs> number uh, six yeah. sherlock holmes 
So a lot of the same actors. Um, uh, again, I same story, you. same accent. Yeah, <laughs> uh, a lot of moving parts. Uh, instead of gangs, it's more individuals. Um, uh, yeah, I've been talking. Why, why don't you say what you did? Is your no. number snatch? Wait, 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 so we're on your number seven. And is, he, is so snatch yours on your is list? snatch? Snatch is not on my list. No. Oh, okay. Um, no, no, no. But I do really like that film. I was just saying that's my favorite Guy Ritchie film. I see. I see. Um, Brad Pitt, superstar power. um, Yeah. I'll tell you this. Incredible physique. Uh, (laughs) It was like wiry, 1% body fat. Yeah. Um, And uh, yeah, uh, Jason Statham, a clear uh, movie star. Um, That's right. That was early on for him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, not much to say. Uh, it, I'll say Lock, Sock, and Snatch kind of go hand in hand. Um, sure. And I tried to, I thought Rock and Roller was going to be a lot better, but it's a lot of narration. I was like, okay, Guy Ritchie, you, you kind right. of lost um, You're number seven. Yeah, so mine, So I want to backtrack for a second because mine are, there are kind of like groupings to mine. So nine and ten, those were films uh like I said, that sort of represent like a community or um, uh, just something special to me in that regard, uh, but aren't necessarily considered like the greatest films of all time. Right. Um, I don't think any of mine are either. So, <laughs> And and, and I, with these, some of these orders, you could switch some of these around. And, and the reason I bring that up is between, between seven and eight, you could switch them. Like you could s- say that i actually like maybe enjoy inglorious bastards more than this next film but uh just to set it up like i said i picked inglorious bastards because that was definitively the best writing i had seen for a scene in a movie and that opened the door for me to quentin tarantino number seven i have to put it on my list because it is definitively the greatest acting performance that I oh. always think of when I think of what is the greatest acting performance. And it is a streetcar named desire, which ah. is, of course I'm talking about Marlon Brando, although <clears throat> they're all, they're all pretty damn good in that film. Um, yeah. I, I don't watch this film as much as the other ones on this list. I'll watch it from time to time. It's, you know, it's a little depressing, but Brando's um his just like presence on screen is just unlike anything I've ever seen before. I feel like <laughs> except for if you see him in On the Waterfront. That's another one where it's just like holy shit, this Your guy posture. is miles above everyone else. I feel like often with really great acting performances, they I don't know, maybe it's the way they're shot now. But I feel like a lot of the performances we see, they feel a little bit more calculated to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Whereas Brando, watching him, he just does not give a fuck. He is his character and um, uh, he is just so in it. He's he it doesn't feel like he cares where the camera is or who's or what what's going on. It's just I am present in the scene and and more so than just about anyone else I've ever seen on film. You ever see it? Uh, I I have seen it. Um, I saw it before I got into Marlon Mm -hmm. Brando, but yeah, very powerful movie. Um, You know, obviously I saw it knowing the Stella line, but Mm -hmm. seeing what led up to it and just, uh, you know, it has how awful his life is. Yeah. uh, alcohol on top of yeah. that um just really powerful stuff it's a it's a it, the line gets made fun of a lot but maybe because those people don't really know the the subject matter of the movie so yeah well and i feel like he says the line in a different way than most people say it when they're joking oh, about sure, the movie sure. and uh like it's like what you said it's the lead up to it and uh yeah i mean when i think about yeah, when I think about acting, I, that's I always think about that role because he just was so incredible, um, and it was a great film. It was I I really enjoyed it. Um, okay, let's move up to my next 
I, 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 maybe I'll say tier. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But uh, my top six films are all films that I would love someday to make a film basically inspired by one of these films. Um, uh, I would love to make something inspired by Rocky Horror as well and Priscilla. But um, anyways, I'll go into number six. Number six, Sideways. Uh, I've mentioned this to you before. I so, actually do watch this movie a lot, actually, because of you. <laughs> yeah. I, you watch it a lot because of me? Yeah. yeah. Oh. It's on, it's, I think it's on Hulu right now. Oh, sweet. I, I watch it all the time. Um, I watch it. I've been watching it probably once every three to six months. Cause it's just, it's, it's wine. It's coming of age. It's, you know, the mid thirties struggle. It's, uh, it's, um, it's just the perfect blend of comedy and drama. It doesn't, it doesn't really, um, force itself to be one or the other. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a story. Yeah. Which is how I think stories should be. Um, or that's how I would prefer to create things like, and so I, I like to see other things out there that are done in a way that i enjoy and um and the, just the performance uh, the performances of the four main actors are really awesome really yeah. awesome you know now looking back at it i think i i would actually <laughs> looking at it with more thoughtful eyes i would argue that maybe uh maya <laughs> Maybe she she could have been written just a little bit better because there is a lot of like uh, I don't know there's a lot of like mansplaining that goes on in the film <laughs> even, though, even though they write her as this very intelligent great woman it's just wow. like there's there's and maybe that goes into uh, Paul Giamatti's character because he isn't a great guy like he's an imperfect like you start the movie with him stealing money from his mom. Know, right. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe, it, maybe that's not a fair um, criticism I have, but it is um, something that I noticed probably because, you know, in the last few years, more and more women involved in Hollywood, you know, have brought to light how a lot of scripts, you know, uh, don't give them the benefit of the doubt. You know, they're, <clears throat> They're just not written in, in in with the same level of strength that some of the male characters can be written. And I, I just remember I, I heard that and then watched the movie. And it's like, oh, yeah, Maya, they, they do kind of, you know, she doesn't quite have the the same level of complexity as uh, Miles right. or um, what's his face? What's his friend's face by Miles and Jack. Um, mm -hmm. But. I, whatever that that's just like a small side note i was thinking about but i think it's such a great film and i would love someday to possibly make something like that and maybe i'm currently working on something like that who knows um let's hear what your number six is let me say something about sideways this movie oh kind yeah of, this movie kind of freaked me out oh really uh, in the fact like wow um relationships can be real fickle based on who's in them yeah like when when is it is it jack the actor yeah that he uh when he's like <laughs> just completely unhinged on a supposed bachelor party i was like yeah whoa man like this is i think i saw it you know obviously before i was married before i even had i was with my uh now wife I was like, well, is this like, is this how like marriages are? Like, <laughs> is this what a bachelor party is? I don't want, I don't want yeah. that to be the truth. Um, and then, you know, he like, obviously, you know, this is a spoiler alert. Can we spoil? Yeah. Well, I already started spoiling it. So <laughs> no one's listening. Anyway, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, when he like gets caught and obviously breaks his nose and then he like, does it again with the waitress uh, at, a, at a different restaurant. I was like, yeah, dude, stop. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, about Paul Giamatti's character, it kind of scared me in the fact like, wow, life really might not end up how you want it. He yeah. put all this effort into his book and, you know, the publisher doesn't take it. It's just like, well, there goes, you know, my baby, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's like, guess I can go on back to, uh, you know, teaching high school English. Um, yeah. 
So yeah, it, it, that, I'll say that it freaked me out, but it did. It is a really great movie, really powerful um, performance by Paul Giamatti um, in a movie that, you know, it doesn't <laughs> kind of, there's a theme. It's a one-off. There's no explosions. It's not a franchise. Yeah. yeah. It's a really unique story uh, and obviously great, great um, scenery. Uh, uh, and I learned a lot about wine. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it it also um so similar to how with like Rocky Horror or Priscilla, they make me think of something from my real life. Um, you know, sideways makes me think of yeah, going to Napa with my friends or family or just dreaming of the dip, you know, someday I want to go down to where this film was shot. And um uh and I do think some of those some of those things that you talk about they do resonate with me in the film it's like oh man like what if you do marry someone and they are as fucked up as jack yeah. or um what if i write something like miles and you know it just it doesn't matter um yep yeah but and also <laughs> i think that's part of the uh that that yeah I do like that he he gets the girl in the end, but that's part that's probably the, the other thing that that's I like think that is, Hollywood ending. It's that's part of my criticism is like she's so sweet and nice, and this guy is so fucked up, and like and oh she's really like... she's still cool with it the whole time. Oh, and she's shut like the fuck up. <laughs> and she's so much better looking than he is. It's like and I, younger. <laughs> well, it's like I I mean because when I watch that film, I put myself in Paul Giamatti's situation. I'm like, yep, that's me, depressed. I ah. just fuck me. And then it's like, oh, but yeah, you sneak off, you go have wine with your friends, and like you're super bougie about it. Yep, that's me. And ah. it's like, oh, you're talking to this hot chick. Oh, and she puts up with all your shit, and you get her in the end. What the fuck? That's not me. Like that, <laughs> that is fucking bullshit. <laughs> but, but I do like Sandra O's oh character as well. Um, I'm blanking on the character's name. Um, what's her name? Uh, I have to look it up. This is gonna this is gonna bother me. Um, but she is brilliant. Um, Stephanie. Stephanie, right? Yeah, she's she's great, and uh, her whole dynamic with uh, Thomas Hayden Church. Thomas Hayden Church is so fucking funny in that film too. I'm going to yeah. watch this film very soon now, because now that we're talking about it, this has gotten me <laughs> pumped up for this film. Um, Anyways, we should let's let's do you have anything else to say about Sideways or should we just keep it? Going? No, uh, just thank you for turning me on to it. Oh, yeah. Happy to. It's, oh, it's so good. Um, I think we haven't done your number six, right? Uh, Inglorious Bastards. We talked about it. Ah, uh, um, yes, yes. So we now have a top five. Do you want to make this a two parter? No, let's just for wait. Do you have to go? I gotta go to the bathroom. Okay, just go to the bathroom, and I'll I'll pause it. Okay. We are back from our quick break, and I just grabbed myself a new uh, San Pellegrino <laughs> <laughs> Aranciata Rosa <laughs> Blood Orange. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so uh, let's recap the list. I have them right here. God, this is I, the longest top ten of all time. Starts with oh, like a thirty-minute honorable oh. mention. <laughs> <laughs> we'll rattle them up. My my ten <clears throat> through six: Goodwill Hunting, Heat, Lock, Sock, and Two Smoking Barrels, Snatch, Inglorious Bastards. Yours, Mine Priscilla were, Queen of the Desert. Yep, Rocky Horror, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Inglorious Bastards, Streetcar Named Desire, Sideways. And I think you were going to add a little bit more to your thoughts on Inglorious Bastards, right? Or No, um, for, a, for a future movie. Oh, okay. And I'm going to talk about it, yeah. Okay, so let's go into the top five. Um, you go first. The Big Lebowski. Oh, baby. Um, I really have no idea what this movie is even about. <laughs> um. <laughs> But again, it's just a unique story of just honestly, sometimes I think my favorite movies are just when you meet someone at a bar, a friend or a stranger, and they're like, do you want to hear a crazy ass story of what happened today and, or last week? Mm -hmm. And if you, if you made a movie about that thing, like even sideways, uh, um, 
uh, Big Lebowski, he like, like I, my my rug got stolen or something, and yeah. this all this crazy chain of events happened. Lock second to smoke mirror snatch, um, incredible, just writing and scenes and relationships. Um, Steve Buscemi is a real under underappreciated, maybe a hidden uh, a secret underrated MVP of the movie. Uh, he gives us some heart. Um, yeah, uh, there's not really much more to say. It's just super entertaining and no life lessons from it, but really cool writing and and just, I think, hilarious. The dude abides. <laughs> yeah, just the quotables. <laughs> That's the best thing from this movie. I'm going to have to rewatch it because I never <laughs> I never connected with that movie. No, I'll, people hate it or people yeah. think it's the best movie ever. <laughs> and I fall into, I fall into the, the ladder there. Yeah. I'll okay. Well, I'll still give it a try, but I'm gonna it's, watch. It's the Coen Brothers, right? Uh, I think so. Uh, quick, they, uh, quick Google they here. Some, they do some. They do. Uh, they do some really unique type stories. Yeah, it was the Coen Brothers. Like, oh brother, we're out there. <laughs> um. Oh yeah. Stuff. Uh, yeah. Give it another another world, and then we'll we'll do our top ten next week. So. <laughs> <laughs> what is your number five that'll be the whole podcast just every week a new top 10 films of all time <laughs> honorable mention mortal Kombat. yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay here we go uh continuing on number five star wars the original a new hope a new hope uh i love star wars when i was a kid I still love Star Wars. It's getting a little different now. It's as they expand that universe and crank them out. Uh, there's really good stuff, but it's it is it is different than uh, what I connect with with the uh, the original because the original to me I, I think about my childhood because uh, you know growing up it was just the original three and then eventually I think middle school and high school was the prequels but um but star wars a new hope uh i you know i think it's my favorite film in the star wars franchise a lot of people will pick other films and i get it but i think star wars a new hope um despite its flaws and you know it does have some um it's the one that started it all sure did None of that other stuff would have happened unless George Lucas was able to pull that thing together. And um, I also will point out one of the cool things about that film that I feel like got lost as Star Wars went on and on is that the force in A New Hope is not really about telekinetic abilities. I mean, you get to episode nine and it's all about flying through the air <laughs> and like having things like circling around you and like these giants like, like matrix putting your hand leaps. up and just yeah. <laughs> I mean, like... Yeah, it's basically you can do it. It's the matrix. You can just yeah, stop exactly. you can stop the bullets. You can <laughs> do those bounding leaps from like <laughs> like building to building or like, you know, wreck to wreck, you know, when yeah. they're out on the water. Um but it was more of just like, I don't know, like this Zen thing in connection with the universe and like, yeah, you know, with oh, Obi-Wan okay. is like manipulating people with like the, the Jedi trick. And then even when uh, Luke, uh, spoiler alert, when Luke uh, b- blows up the Death Star, mm-hmm. it's not I don't I don't think of it as necessarily like oh i'm going to specifically with my mind like move the laser into that air duct no, no, no. vent it's more of a like willing that into existence kind of a yeah, thing yeah. um which i really like about it um what was i going to look up i was going to look up something about star wars to share with the i don't force. know why i just pulled this up um oh i know why i just pulled this up it's because uh, side note, um, aside from the film, it's also means a lot to me as just like uh, the filmmaking aspect of it. Like I mentioned with Lord of the Rings during the honorable mention section, um, 
And there's a there's a great documentary about the making of Star Wars, which I highly recommend to anyone who likes Star Wars or anyone who likes filmmaking. Um, and I'm looking it up right now. It's um, is it uh, what's it called? Something an empire building an em- is it building an empire? What is it? Empire of Dreams. I think so. Is this it? Empire of Dreams, the story of the Star Wars trilogy. That's what I'm thinking of. Anyone who likes Star Wars, you should go watch that. It's on Disney Plus. Um, or anybody who likes filmmaking, because it, and I actually have watched it in the past to inspire me with my projects, because when they were making Star Wars, that thing was going to shit. It was falling apart. There was like semi mutinies happening because oh, wow. people were just like, what? Well, People, people working on the film were openly just dogging it. They're like, this is some shitty kids movie. Yeah, this is going to yeah. be awful. And it wasn't into, and because it was like, there was nothing was like, like it. It was like action figures. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was awful. And also uh, it required so much in the editing process. Like, you know, Darth Vader's voice was added after in the right, editing process. Right. And then the music with John Williams, which is probably low key like probably the 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 most consistent strongest part of the whole yeah, franchise yeah. is is his music and you see it in this documentary where they put the movie together and it goes from this shitty thing where everyone hates George Lucas and thinks like he's making something terrible <laughs> to him being able to pull this thing out and uh make it make it something special and then you know it be- became the phenomenon it became um do you have anything to say about star wars just uh i I don't think i've this might be wrong but i feel like it's the first or or what put it on the map like universe building or world Mm. building as far as like i mean he put so much thought into like Mm -hmm. the spaceship the millennium falcon had its own personality Mm -hmm. and the bar or this planet over here and the, the entire a race of of beings are from this one or mm-hmm. a whole another thing is from here uh like sky city looks so much different than you know whatever tattooing uh really heavy thought process put into it like even i think it's more impressive than harry potter where it's all in the same planet i'll say like we're all, we all look like humans <laughs> and there's like yeah, yeah some giants and some mythical creatures but like to do like planets and galaxies away uh, is is just really it's just no other word to, uh, to say other than it's super cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, nice. Number four, number four is another classic film, and this is actually well, Star Wars is on is on a lot of top films of all time list. Uh, but this is very close to the top on many of these lists, and it is Casablanca. Have you ever seen it? I have. It's uh, frankly, my dear. <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, that's not Casablanca. That's, that's gone um, with the wind. Fuck. Gone with the wind. <laughs> then I have. Have I seen? I've seen it like years ago. Casablanca is uh, in all the gin joints. Oh yes, yes, blah blah blah, or uh, play it again, Sam, or yeah. Um, but uh, fun fact, uh, I thought that movie was so cool in high school that that is um, uh, how I picked out my like tux for senior ball. I got a white dinner jacket that matched um, Humphrey Bogart's jacket in oh, that nice. film, which was a little out of place for me because I feel like the person who wears a white jacket to prom is the asshole who wants to stand <laughs> out, but it had nothing to do with that for me. It was just like, that is the coolest look that a guy can have. And I had to do it. Um, but I got to see a picture of that. I could probably dig it up. It's probably on Facebook. Um, but let me take a step back. The reason why it's so high on my list, and this is kind of similar to what I was saying about Inglorious Bastards. Um, I think so. Inglorious Bastards had the best written scene that I had ever seen. Um, 
Casablanca to me was so fascinating because I saw it when I was 18 and I knew almost nothing about film. I, I hadn't really started studying acting seriously or storytelling. Um, but I remember just naturally realizing how it was, there was such poetry with the words. It was like so well written um, over, for the whole movie. And I realized that there were so many expressions in that film that had become cliche over time. And it was like, oh, well, just this is where they came from. Yeah, and yeah. they didn't, but they, they sounded so naturally, they sounded so natural in the film. And it was, it was so interesting. And there was such a class about it. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's my ideal bar would be to like, go <laughs> to, um, go to that club if it if it really existed which i don't think anything like that exists but maybe they do for tourists but yeah to go over to casablanca and morocco and go to a place like that and get all dressed up i i just think it's like the coolest thing ever and it's such a good classic film um anyways you've seen it though i have uh not as an adult so mm. i'll give it another well isn't it like three hours no no i think it's probably think only not Less than gone. two hours. Um, I just rewatched it actually a couple weeks ago, and it it uh, it's so good. It it's my favorite classic film, and it's from nineteen forty three. That's crazy. Like almost eighty years ago. Um, I'm trying to look up the running time because I think it's pretty short. Yeah, one hundred and two minutes. So, anyways, what's uh what's number four for you? I said we'd go, we'd talk more about Quentin Tarantino, Django Unchained. Oh, nice. Yes, and kind of going back to what I was going to say about Inglorious Bastards, Quentin Tarantino, um, has. I my theory is that he just gives the audience what they want to see and hear, even if they don't admit they want to see it. At the end of Inglorious Bastards, we saw a really graphic machine gun to Adolf Hitler's face. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know about you, but like I was just like, "Fuck yeah!" Yeah, it was <laughs> awesome. Uh, I was like, "Cause that's yeah, he, he. He's a monster, and this is what you want to see to a monster." Um, at the end of Django, you see Django, Jamie Fox, just like shoot up all these slave owners and yeah. and, and um and in like the worst way, blows up fucking Samuel Jackson. <laughs> yeah. No remorse because why would you have any remorse for them? Yeah. Like, women, sure, I'll fucking kill you. Um, and you know, even though it's not the right thing, and we don't, we don't uh, um, want to admit it. It's just like, yeah, everyone was cheering for him for the that whole forty minute stretch. Um, same with Kill Bill. Same with at the end of um, uh, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah, uh, where it's like this didn't even happen, but like. This is the rage Quentin Tarantino feels feels for uh, this actress who got c killed by you know the Manson uh, tribe. It's like, yeah, I want to see you bash this this woman's face into a phone over and over again. As a <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's <clears throat> this is what I want to see, and you build up to it. You know, there's obviously great script writing uh, along with that. Um, but uh, as far as the action sequences that, and and blood and gore that uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino brings to his films, uh, Django is one to uh, really fulfill that 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 um, dopamine uh, hit for me when I watch that. I, <clears throat> you know, you talking about it makes me feel guilty for not having Tarantino higher on my list because he probably is um, the director who influences me the most. And I love Django. I, when I saw it, when it was new, I remember liking it better than Inglorious Bastards. It was like, Oh wow, yeah. he, this is even better. Um, and I almost put it on my list, but I went with Inglorious Bastards because of the writing of that first scene. Cause there's like, that was the, that was a, a key standout in my journey as someone like watching film and understanding it. But one thing that I took away from Django was I remember 
yeah, we all have crazy ideas and like I I very vaguely remember this, but I remember before I saw Django. I remember just somewhere lost in my thoughts. I remember thinking and having an idea of how fun it would be to use like to mix up music and this is not a unique idea to me or anyone but like use like contemporary music yeah yeah and put it on something older as long as it mixes and the point i'm getting to is i remember thinking like oh but that's like a crazy idea and then in django when i think it's when they're it might be when they're on the way to Candyland and they're he's playing the uh is that a Rick Ross song or what is that yeah, song he's I, playing? It's like I got a hundred something something. Oh yeah. And it's just like I remember I was just jaw to the floor thinking like, holy shit, like you can do that. You can do that. Yeah. Like and it and it fucking works. And it was like, like it doesn't have to be a t- a music from that time period. <laughs> it's just like you can like it was just the the fact that you could do whatever you wanted. Like that was one of those moments that clicked with me. Um, he hired Riza to do the music, um, I guess, uh, curating for that movie. Um, but obviously, he gets final say. But I totally get. I totally know what you mean. When I was when I first saw it in the movie theater, I looked around and people were just like bobbing their head to that yeah, part. And yeah. Like, oh yeah, we're fucking doing this. We're we're we we've, we've interloped this, uh, <laughs> this 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 slave we're owner. Going to fucking Candyland. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna get this guy. Um, we're gonna fucking kill Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah. And everyone else is like, that's gonna be me someday. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um speaking to uh uh leonardo dicaprio probably uh, uh very high on the list of most evil characters of all time mm-hmm. um he's magnetic you can i cannot keep yeah. my eyes off him off the screen when he's on screen especially in this movie the accent the uh, um kind of gravitas but yeah and the little choices he chooses to kind of show that he's actually not at the same level as um yeah uh, um Christoph Waltz uh as yeah. his character where he's just like what my favorite line is when uh um what my favorite one of my favorite lines is when uh um I forget his name the German he uh he he does a toast and he does the German toast he goes prost and <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio go, just looks at him. He's like German. <laughs> just says German. He's just like didn't know what he said. He just says fucking German. The word German. Just to like say it's like, uh, yeah, I'm a little outclassed here. Uh, um, yeah, intellectually. Uh, but that's all I'll say about that. Great movie. I will say this. I do think Inglorious Bastards is a better movie. I just find myself watching mm. Django a lot more. Well. I'll, so Leo is fantastic. Also, Christoph Waltz is fantastic. Also, Samuel L. Jackson is fantastic yep. because he is maybe my favorite actor. Um, even though you know, favorite can mean a lot of different things. Like, um, I already said Brando's performance is my favorite of all time, but I just love watching samuel jackson he picks the best movies to be in and i always like watching him and uh he has a good relationship with quentin tarantino too oh definitely and um i just was like that was like a very daring role and i was just kind of shocked to see him go that far with it and obviously that's what the role required but it was just like well shit like he you know he just he doesn't care like it didn't seem to me like he cared what anyone thought about him and doing that role and how you know just just the negativity associated with that role uh but it was just like man he he nailed it and it's the same thing with leo like that pure evil character but it's like that he nailed it that's acting and only the best (laughs) go that far um he did say in an interview when he was when approached about the role, uh, he was like, "Oh, so you want me to play the worst character of all time?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's like, yeah. It's like, um, so yeah. That's all I'll say about that. What is your? <clears throat> what number are we on? Number three. We're in the top three now. Yeah. 
so number three. So I'll have to explain this one. Number three on my list is Moulin Rouge. Okay. I just remember when I saw it in high school. And I remember being mesmerized by the opening sequence where John Leguizamo is like on the rooftop and he's singing There Was a Boy or the their version of it. And how this like transports into this, you know, Parisian fairy tale about a writer. And I always like, I think it's probably different for people now because with the internet, like you just, you're exposed to so many different types of people and we celebrate differences. But I remember at that time in my life, you know, when it, when you think about who you have to be in the world, I think. I just always felt like I'm not quite, I'm not quite a hundred percent a jock, even though I did sports. Mm -hmm. And so I, I guess I never <clears throat> saw a man like a guy who was like, like a real strong man, but was artistic and a writer and creative and like romantic. And that's Ewan McGregor's character. And, and what goes along with the storytelling in that and how there's the connection to performance and stuff, even though I wasn't a performer at that time, but I still was so into the arts. And I really think it's it kind of just connected with me. It was like the first film that like kind of stopped me in my tracks where I was just like, oh my gosh, this is representing something inside of me I've never seen before. And awesome. so that's why it's very high on my list. I wish I had more to say about it. I have not seen it. It um it came out in 01 and yeah. I was 15 and I was like I, I was just like this movie is not for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um but I will uh, I'll have to give it a shot based on your uh on your uh comments here. Well, I remember too like um so in high school I played volleyball very competitively year round. And I remember my senior year, like the newspaper, like the no local newspaper there uh, for the sports section, there was, there was one week or I think it was a week where I was like at student athlete of the week. And they like, you know, they ask you, what's your favorite food? What's your favorite album? And my answers, I remember my answers to that were pasta and outcast. Cause you remember outcast when they had like speaker yeah. box and the love below that was yeah. like so cool. And then I remember they asked for my favorite movie <clears throat> and they asked that first. And I had to say Moulin Rouge, but I was embarrassed to say it because at that uh, time it was just like, people would be like, Oh, you're gay. Yeah. And so I remember I said, Oh, let me pass on that. Let me answer the other questions. I answered the other questions. And then the person, the girl interviewing me on the phone circles back. I remember saying Moulin Rouge and she like paused and was just like, okay. And then that was the end of that. And then I remember telling my teammates that and they like one of them called me the F word and they're like, oh, and I didn't, I mean, I didn't think People anything of it. A, yeah. It's just a different time. But I, I remember thinking that at that time where it was like, I remember being so insistent upon it where it was like, no, this is fucking my favorite film. Uh, yeah. Like this connects with me more than anything else. And like, <laughs> if people want to call me stuff, like I don't fucking care. Like this is yeah. it. And uh, that's awesome. Anyways, uh, I don't know how well it holds up over time. Like, uh, it's uh, but I think it. Um, actually, I do know it. I've I've watched it a few times. It's actually a crazy film. It's super fast paced. It, it's wild and nuts and maybe that's part of what makes it work but um it's also uh you know a big part of Baz Luhrmann's or Baz however you say it Baz Luhrmann's uh yeah. legacy and kind of what really took him into the stratosphere after Romeo and Juliet um but it made stars of a lot of people but um I think it inspired many other movie musicals after it um Anyways, enough talk about that. What's your wait? Oh, I have to we're I have to do my number two, right? Okay. Okay. Cause you've already done your number three. I have not. I thought number three was Django. Or was Django. Okay, what's your Basically, number three? You've been doing two and I've been doing one. 
but oh, it's not- shit i thought we were going okay i thought we were doing okay so you go to your three the stakes are very low uh <laughs> cur- curveball alert home alone oh really christmas is coming up i watch it every christmas i think it is um absolutely hilarious it is i i you get um a, a world-class actor to play um <clears throat> these goons uh, uh marvin harry to do yeah. physical comedy yeah uh, basically perfectly um i i i'm i laugh so hard every single time i know exact all the beats that are coming um but it's not just it's not just that i think the movie has a lot of heart um it's uh you know macaulay culkin um has this uh, revelation about family i think mm-hmm. uh Catherine o'hara is actually really good in it um yeah, uh, just a really fun movie. I, I watch every Christmas. I will say Home Alone 2, I think, is funnier. But Home Alone 1 is a better movie. Um, and Home Alone 3 is worse than Ocean's 12. I'll say I'll say that. <laughs> it is good. Thoughts, I, I rewatched it, like, Alone. I think last year or the year before that. I remember watching it. It's Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I watched it as a kid. It is yeah, really it funny. Yeah, it takes me back it, to, to when I was a kid. Yeah. It it hold it does hold up. It's really mm-hmm. good. Um, um your number two. I'll say you say your number two, then I'll say my number two, and then I'm pretty sure our ones are going to be the same. They're not the same. Oh really? Okay. There's no way. I would be okay, shocked. Then, then you're right. It's not the same if you if you're saying that. So what is your number two? <laughs> Now I'm wondering what you put. Is it going to be like Space Jam? Or <laughs> okay, my number two. My number two is the uh, most uh, recent movie on my list. And Welcome it is the, the masterpiece by the Daniels called Everything Everywhere All at Once. Oh, uh, yes. Very this good film freaking blew my mind. And <laughs> it's the only film on my list I've only seen one time so far. Mm-hmm. Uh but I'm going to watch it again soon. Um, it's kind of like um, what I was saying about Django, how watching it and realizing, oh my gosh, you can do whatever you want. And yep. then seeing, um, actually, uh, I mentioned the uh, Star Wars um, documentary. There's a part in that where they were talking about a way that they were reusing some footage and editing it, editing it in a very, like, uh, in a certain way to fit what they needed, even though it's not what the, they caught from the actor in that time. And I remember thinking like, Oh my gosh, you can literally do whatever you want, whatever makes a film. A lot of pieces together. Yeah. And then on top of that, with when it comes to the writing aspect of it, not just the editing, but everything everywhere all at once is just batshit crazy, but it works. And it's, and that is, the kind of stuff I would like to write. I would like to be able to just do the weirdest things that come in my mind and not have to filter it because I'm like, Oh, people won't get it. Like, Oh, that'll be weird. Like I want to do stuff like their film. And, um, I, the, 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 the film that it made me think of was 2001, a space odyssey, just in terms of the, like, um, I don't know, just, just the way that they, kind of had more of this abstract artistic abstracts maybe not the right word but um just just the way they um told their story kind of with chapters and sort of had this kind of uh way of telling the story that sort of mapped out kind of the human experience in a way Mm -hmm. and um Oh, it's brilliant. It's just I, so fucking good. Have you you saw it, right? Yeah. Did you cry? I did cry when I when wept, she's I like, wept, "Do not." Bro. I wept. I I <laughs> cried at the part where um, what's the mom's name? I can't remember her name. But remember I, how her her daughter keeps calling her by her name at that point. Once they've kind of broken down the fact that the, the nihilist attitude of like nothing matters and um, we're from different universes or something like that or realities. And um, 
when that part where they're fighting and she's like, stop calling me her name. Like yeah, yeah. I'm your mom. And like, I remember it's just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's so real. It's like, and that's the brilliance of the film is like, it is so good about kind of laying the framework for how nothing truly matters, but uh-huh. then kind of flipping it on its back and being like, but everything, matters. even in spite of knowing that truth, like it doesn't, you can never take away the fact that stuff does matter to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, hundred uh, percent. It, it's obviously very sci-fi, but it, it all comes down to re- the relationship between families, which is something everyone can relate to uh, really outside the box way of, of telling that story. Um, just absolutely incredible. I want to wait a couple of years be- maybe, or a little bit before I watch it again to give us some fresh eyes, but hundred percent, very, very good. Number two. What's your number two? Wolf of Wall Street. Oh. Um, going back to what we said about uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, he is perhaps just, not just as evil, uh, still pretty evil uh, in this movie, um, but you can't take your eyes off of him. Um, Jonah <laughs> Hill's character, also just a complete piece of shit. They're all, you, he does a good job of, uh, Martin Scorsese, a good job of showing you that these guys are evil and pieces of shit, um, but you keep rooting for them for whatever reason. And honestly, that that last scene where it's like showing us that like we're all captivated by them and this lifestyle. Anyone, I'll say any guy has that in the back of their head that they would love this lifestyle of being a rock star where you have yeah. all this freaking money and you can just do it, literally do whatever you want. They're on a plane. They call the pilot the N word. He's like, oh, they call it. That's that's a really underrated scene. Was like, oh, I call the pilot the N word, and then Jonah Hill's is like, yeah, thank God we're in first class. It's like, yeah, if you have enough money, you can do whatever yeah. you want in this <laughs> world. Um, just just pure evil guys, um, but just completely magnetic way of, of telling a story. And again, that last scene where it's just like, yep, we all want that lifestyle. Uh, yeah. or, or some kind of piece of it um we're jealous of it and we're mad at it um but we um would love to be a part of it if given the chance um there's a really good scene between the fbi agent and leo when they're on the on the yacht mm-hmm. uh, i remember being in the movie theater <clears throat> again on the edge of my seat like <clears throat> is he falling for it uh yeah, at, yeah. or is he like goading him in he's like wow well, you know they give you a free gun when you join the bureau. And it's like, you know, well, you know, if you, you know, uh, you know, do me this favor, you know, I could get you in on a, on a thing. And then he like motions his friend over. And then it, the, uh, it, it's a, a three shot, I guess, um, where it shows him right behind. He's like, can you say that <laughs> just the way you did? <laughs> um, it's a really hilarious scene that I watch over and over on YouTube. That's enough. I mean, do you have any thoughts on uh, Wolf of Wall Street? I've seen that clip on YouTube as well. <laughs> Yeah, it's so funny. <laughs> yeah, no, it's yeah, it's a great film about bad guys. <laughs> yep, very bad guys. There's also another a part where it just shows how what a piece of shit he is. He does this another bachelor party where he just basically cheats on his uh, um, future yeah. wife with all these hookers, um, and he's like walking naked to the window in Vegas, um. And he, and there's like naked, his naked friends and naked women all around. Just such a piece of shit move. He like goes to one of the naked girls and just like grabs her tit as she's asleep and just like keeps walking. Yeah. He's like, that's such a piece of shit thing to do. But you're just like, ah, whatever. Um, yeah, uh, uh, just really a uh, high level of range from Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> on my list, at least. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Want me to go number one first, or are you number one? Uh, I'll go number one. Okay. It's the I would be shocked if this is your number one. It, it isn't. If you're going to be shocked. Well, my my number one is Amelie, the French film. Oh, no. I haven't even seen it. Okay, it's number one. It's been number one on my list forever. I saw it when I was, I think, eighteen, and it just. It's uh from 2001 so I think yeah same same year as Moulin Rouge 
but it's a French film. Um, it is the way it is shot and the way the story is told is just so refreshing and different from most of what we see in the U S um, I think the closest you might say is maybe hints of Wes Anderson isms, but, but not really. Um, and if anything, Wes Anderson might be, might have gotten some inspiration from this film. Uh, although Wes Anderson got going around at that time, but the point is it's a quirky film. It tells the story in very interesting ways it uses all sorts of visual methods and um, the format kind of adapts to the film a bit. Uh, there's narrations, there's um, like claymation stuff. There's like animated oh. stuff I, from, I, I can't really picture how they did it, but um, they did all sorts of interesting things because it's, it's kind of the world through the eyes of this introverted girl or a young woman. And I think if you are an introvert in one way or another, you will connect with this movie a lot. And I don't want to spoil anything about the story because it's like, yeah, I want to see it. it's like, it's just like beautifully simple. It's incredibly simple and, and just fun. And it just, there's something about it when you watch it, it just makes you feel so good. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just can't rave about it. I, I wish I had more to say about it, but I, d I don't want to spoil anything for you. And it's a film that I bought on DVD so that I could have a physical copy so that I don't have to worry about chasing it down somewhere uh, because I think it's pretty hard to find. Um, it's not describing it kind of reminds me of Kill Bill when it goes through chapters and then it goes to... <clears throat> Lucy Liu's character and it goes to like anime for some reason. Is that is that fair to say there's a comparison there? <clears throat> um it doesn't well it doesn't do it that much. Like mm. I'm just I mean you'll see it. It 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 uses some interesting things in the beginning of the film to sort of introduce you to this main character. Um and it and then it sort of releases out of that as you kind of come to present day. And she's a woman uh, because it, it kind of shows her how she grew up very briefly. Um, but it, it, you know, they do some really cool things with camera angles. There's a lot of wide angle lenses that, you know, distort people's faces. Oh, and yeah, sort yeah. of, uh, you know, it, uh, these things that that wouldn't be very safe to do today, like because it would just be it might be seen as very weird uh, for a film to do today. Um and the filmmaker does make really weird stuff. This is probably his most mainstream thing, oddly enough. Um, uh, I can't recommend it enough, though. Yeah, Amelie, it's it's the best. Um, I just I love it. I if if I could make one film, I would want to make a film like Amelie. Can't wait to see it. My number one. I'm dying to know. Pulp Fiction. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I'm surprised it wasn't on yours. Um, but I guess it goes under your uh Inglorious Bastards take. Yeah, I just yeah, I, I wanted to hit some different things with my list, but pulp fiction, yeah, no, I get it. Let's hear this it. This movie gets better every single time I watch it. I mm -hmm. find out something new every single time. Um and when I first saw it, I honestly thought it was completely overrated. And then I got more into movies and I said, oh, this really shake, shook things up on how we could tell stories. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like we're seeing a lot of movies now where it starts in the middle of a story and then mm -hmm. back uh, uh, to the beginning and then we get to get you there. This didn't quite do that, but just the fact of talk, talk, telling a story out of order um when john travolta's character dies i'm like oh that sucks and then you like you see him later again um i thought that was uh uh just you know and then at the end where he kind of comes all all together yeah it's very cool um again i don't really know the lesson or what this movie is about i again i just think it's like 
do you want to hear a crazy story? And then yeah. you show this movie. Um, just different characters, different pieces coming together. And everyone says this all the time. The dialogue is incredible. Um, I, I watch it sometimes with subtitles just to see exactly what um, they're saying. Mm -hmm. I've told you these before, but not for the podcast. When um, Vincent is on the date with Mia, uh, it's obviously a first date. And I think the, the dialogue perfectly encapsulates that these two are completely different people. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is there is chemistry. And what the heck do you talk about when your mob boss tells you to take out his wife? Um, like just <laughs> this dude is on, on edge. He's on heroin. And um, and they bring up he brings up what he has to bring up. He's like, oh, yeah, I heard you did a pilot. Um, and uh, and, you know, what about your husband throwing uh, Tony Rocker, Tony Rocky or I think out of a window? And then they talk about that. And then there's one line where um, he says he came back from Amsterdam. And then Mia says, oh, you know, I go there about once a year to chill out. And he goes, no kidding. I didn't know that. And like she says, why would you? It's like, <laughs> yeah, why would you? Yeah. That's like, that would be bad script writing if she didn't say something about that. Um but it's just that awkwardness that that you know feeling this whole situation out. I I honestly think it's so high level, but it's such it's one line, but it's it says so much more about their relationship and that dynamic in that moment. What are your thoughts on Pulp Fiction? I rewatched it um, in the last two months. Mm -hmm. It I love the pacing of it, and I think because it's a non-linear story, it allows. It allows um, them to present it in a really interesting way where like the first the first scene, you have this this lead up, this build up and you're like, where's this? What's this going to? And then, it, you know, and then it's like, this is a hold up, whatever. Blah, blah, yeah. blah. And it's like, holy shit. And then it goes into the next scene and it's like. Um, where are we? <laughs> but it's like each scene right off the bat there's something that hooks you in and there's something big that happens and so you don't have to have like four or five scenes that lead up to some climax it's like you have these little vignettes that are seemingly independent from one another and as you said as it all comes together it's like oh wow this is like this is really connecting in a really cool way and uh, just makes makes it all just such a richer experience. One thing that stood out to me in the when they're at the uh, the diner is uh, Tarantino's pretty good about making people like you can like feel or you can you can taste how good something is or like you can, you can just like sense it. Um, and he does this in some of his films with beer or margaritas. Mm. But, <laughs> but it but when he has the like the what five dollar milkshake or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. And and they, they go back and forth, they talk about it. It's like that's just milk and ice cream, right? Blah blah blah. They talk about it. And then they they change the subject. And then it comes out, and then John Travolta's, you know, he's like, Hey, can I try that? I just need to yeah. know what it tastes like. And there's all this buildup, and you and you're and it's so great because it's like if anyone else did that, it would be like, I don't fucking care what this guy thinks about the milkshake. Yeah, it's like, but, can we move the story along? Yeah. <laughs> but in that moment, it's just like, what what's go what's the deal with the milkshake? Yep. Yep. And then you just see him just I think his line is like, That's a fucking good milkshake. Yeah, I don't know if it's worth five dollars, but yeah. it's pretty fucking good. Yeah. And <laughs> it's just like there, I just felt myself when I rewatched it recently. It was just like there's kind of like this. I don't know. Like it was, I felt like such a freaking nerd where I was just like, oh yeah, man, I can imagine it now. It's such a fucking yeah. good milkshake. <laughs> like, like I'm just like in agreement with him. And it's like, yeah, yeah they, they, uh, they painted the picture and they, they hooked me in and, uh, Pulp Fiction is what, yeah. Really it's good acting. There. Um, kind of in talking about acting, really good moment before. Like you said, there's no real beginning of a scene. It kind of just draws you in, which yeah. means actors have to have built the that moment before so that you're just like you're off and running um i will say this uh 
a lot of Quentin Tarantino movies have kind of lessons about acting or the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, in Inglorious Bastards, um, it's all you know. There's you know double agents and having to you know act and with the right accent and building that backstory. In Django, um, Christoph Waltz uh, is his character tells Django, "It's like you'll be." where um he tells them it's like you want jamie fox says you want me to be a black slaver slaver it's like that's like lower than low and then the um oh, what the fuck is his name Chris like Waltz, dr schultz I think. dr schultz he says then that's the way you play him it's like yeah like buy into that character which is like what acting mm-hmm. is all about in pulp fiction um that second scene where they're um yeah john Volta and uh um Samuel Jackson. Samuel Jackson are on the way. They're like, you know, just shooting the shit. And then right before they go in, he's like, let's get into character. Um, just that line. And then they walk in and it's just a completely different yeah. vibe. And it's like, yeah, it's like people are different versions of themselves around different people. And just a really high level um, performance to show that um, uh, uh, between john travolta who goes like really quiet and kind of lets um um, uh samuel jackson kind of take the lead and he's just like i don't remember asking you a goddamn thing (laughs) like like, well we were just like talking about like like foot massages right here um and also uh, when they're when they're outside the apartment building they're talking about uh i don't know if they're talking about mia but they're talking about how someone was on a pilot that yeah, didn't yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. That was, so that was about me yeah. yeah he's like well you know based on that pilot they make more shows um, yeah like a little little lesson that uh <laughs> that yeah. maybe in the 90s people didn't really know um yeah high level stuff really good you know kind of what you're talking about the diner scene with the conversation about um the milkshake i kind of use that because Mia calls it out. It's like, no one wants to talk about, you know, the weather or the traffic or whatever. And I kind of use that when I talk to people. I kind of go right to what I really want to know. Because what's, uh, what, who am I? I'm, I'm not going to ask anything offensive. But he's just like, I heard you did a pilot. And he's like, and they talk about that. He's like, can I try that? And, you know, um, he tries the milkshake. He's like, that's yeah. exactly what he wanted to know in that moment. And that's yeah. kind of how I, oh, since I, and then he, when she comes back from the bathroom, what do you think about your husband throwing so-and-so out of the window because he touched your feet? He's like, I touched my feet. Those are real conversations yeah. about that. John Travolta really wanted to know. And I've kind of used that whenever I talk to people, new people and like catching up, because honestly we don't have a lot of time when we hang out and I don't yeah. want to just talk about meaningless BS. I want to know uh, the heart of what's going on in your life uh, yeah. or what I really want to know in the moment. So just really cool, really cool movie. It is really good. It's very inspirational. Um, The other, the other thing I'll say about Tarantino is like, <clears throat> it's hard for me to pick his move. One of his movies. um, Cause I cycle through them. And it's not like with any other director, but I I just cycle through his movies and there's usually one that I'll watch more than the others. So there was a, you know, for a while it was Django. I was like, that's the best one. Mm -hmm. And then Hateful Eight came out and it was like, uh, for whatever reason, there are aspects of that movie that I really like. I used to watch really Hateful like Eight too. a lot, and I thought people did not give it enough credit. I thought it's just yeah. so good, and I was, and it's like, yeah, we could say the other other ones are better, but this is the one I'm choosing to watch repeatedly. Yeah. And then that, then I went through some phases where I was like watching the earlier stuff. I rewatched Reservoir Dogs. I, I've seen all those movies multiple times, and uh, I will also say that recently, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I've been watching that. It wasn't even my favorite Tarantino film when I saw it the first time. I, I thought it was really good, but now that like I've watched it multiple times, it's it might be his like um you know if you think of, if you were to des- describe a a dessert as like really rich and complex, like <clears throat> I would describe Once Upon a Time in Hollywood in that way, where there's just like so much so much depth, but in such it's so concentrated. 
that I don't think you can get it all at once. I think you have to watch it multiple times and it's like, man, like there's so much going on here and here and here. And um, it goes back to what I was saying earlier, where like, I still have, when I think of Hollywood and stuff, like, you know, I, there's still this like affinity about it. And like, just this like glow when you think about it, where it's just like, man, like despite all the hardship and like all that, like there's still that, magic about it and you feel it at yeah. the end when he gets invited into the gate where it's like uh, yeah. he's he's finally in like or he's back in or what however however it really um is meant to be yeah he he's part of he's he's part of that that community yeah. yeah he's in the inner circle yeah yeah those are good picks thank you very much uh let's just recap them real quick we were your, all over the place your number two your number, your your ten through one. Okay, so my, the desert. Yep. Rocky Horror Picture Show, Inglorious Bastards, our only crossover. Streetcar Named Desire, Sideways, Star Wars: New Hope, Casablanca, Moulin Rouge, Everything Everywhere All at Once, Amelie. You had a really diverse, diverse uh, list. Mine, kind of one one note here. Pretty gritty stuff. <laughs> Will Hunting, Heat, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, Snatch. Inglorious Bastards, Big Lebowski, Django Unchained, Home Alone, Wolf of Wall Street, Pulp Fiction. What what a what a podcast! That was. I know longest one I've recorded probably, well, but I you know I and you know I think this was really fun and part of why my list was so varied was uh, they all you know they mean different things to me and you know uh, I thought it'd be fun to. No, but I learned. I feel like I learned something about you. I definitely recommend Amelie when you have a chance. Hunt yeah. that down. Will that do. I recommend that to anyone. Uh, that one holds up over time. It's really special. Um, but yeah, uh, fuck, it's just hit midnight for me. For me, <laughs> thank you so. Thank you for on the East Coast. Yeah, I appreciate. Yeah, it. Yeah, no, this was good. This was perfect. This is what this is what I was hoping to have and. So um thank you everyone for listening and I've we've <laughs> recorded another episode together where we talk about uh directing acting and different perspectives on stuff and there's more coming up stay tuned well I'll ha- I'll have you on again for sure we'll do <laughs> in a, in two and a half months We'll do top 10 films of 2023. (laughs) (laughs) See if our lists change at all. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See ya.